thank you for joining us live uh, on Zoom and YouTube. Today's event is hosted by CGCC USA, CGCC Houston, and CGCC DC. For any new viewers who are not familiar with our organization, CGCC is the largest independent, nonpartisan, nongovernmental, nonprofit organization uh, representing Chinese enterprises in America. More information about our organization can be found uh, at cgccusa.org. My name is Go Yu. I am the executive director of CGCC DC. And today I'm joined by my co-moderator, the executive director of CGCC Houston, Ling Yi Liu. Good afternoon, everyone. To... This is Ling Yi, and I'm very honored to co-host this exciting event with my colleague Yu Ge from CGCC DC, and I'm from Houston. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Nandi. Uh, the honor is all mine, Ling Yi. Uh, the, the event is open to the public and on the record. Uh, opinions expressed here by us and by our panelists do not necessarily represent that of the institutions we work for. Uh, we want to make today's session uh, interactive, so the audience is welcome to submit questions through the Q&A function on Zoom, uh, so that is the uh, only way that I'm going to recognize your question. So please use that function. Don't type your uh, don't text um, type your question in uh, in chat. And today's topic is vaccination and the post COVID workplace. To to reopen or not reopen is the question that all business leaders are asking. Well, intuition tells us working from home is less productive than working in office. There have been multiple studies that show that the ability to work anywhere has led to increased productivity, employee happiness, real income levels, and better environmental outcomes. Nonetheless, some degrees of in-office interaction and collaboration are going to be necessary. So how do companies reopen safely, giving employees different perceptions about vaccination and their newfound love for flexibility. We have gathered panelists of diverse expertise to answer all of your questions on this topic. Uh, I will now hand over the floor to my co-moderator Ling Yi to introduce our panelists. Well, thank you, Yuka. So now let let me introduce our best panelists today. So uh, the first panelist is Mr. Farad Zabini. He is a director of System Infection Prevention and Control of Houston Methodist. At Houston Methodist, Mr. Zabini has a central role in the fight against COVID-19 in its eight hospitals. So as a command center member, he is responsible for all PPE guidance and training as well as infection control measures. And our second panelist is Ms. Annie Lee, uh, the manager and director of People Advisory Service of Ernst Young. Ms. Lee has over 20 years of experience working with global organizations and advising on human capital issues across geographic and organizational boundaries. Our third panelist is Mr. Alan Wong, and who is an established HR executive and the managing director and head of human resource department at the Bank of China US branches. Uh, last but not least, Mr. Philip uh, Bercozzi is the U.S. Practice Co-Chair of Leaders International Employment Law Practice Group and Co-Chair of the Finance Services Industry Group. Also, he is CGCC Legal Counsel Committee member, who is our old friend, and welcome all panelists today. All right. So, well, then let's, uh, without further ado, let's get the discussion started. I would like to begin with our uh, infectious disease expert, uh, Mr. Zavani, how necessary is it for employees to be 100% vaccinated before they return to office? Should offices reopen if a small number of employees still refuse to be vaccinated? For employees who have recovered from COVID-19 or you know, have been vaccinated in foreign countries, uh, is a full US vaccination regimen still necessary for them? I guess I got a whole bunch of questions lined up for you. See if you can walk us through that. Sure. Um, uh, thank you very much. It's an honor to be with you today. Um, let me just take a couple seconds to introduce my, uh, uh, my organization, Houston Methodist. We're a, a premier healthcare organization here in the Houston area. Uh, it's, it's made of a 2,500 bed plus uh, healthcare organization. We have eight uh, hospitals 
Uh, we have the physician organization, also the research institute that we depend on a lot for our research. Uh, so thank you for, for inviting me to this, uh, to this webinar. In regards to your question uh, for uh, the, the, the percentage of uh, uh, people that should be vaccinated before they come to back to work and so on, it, it's, it, it's essentially impossible to, to have 100% of the uh, of the work uh, force um, uh, vaccinated, and that's why we don't think 100% is is really necessary. Uh, but a good number of the or a good percentage of the uh, employees should be vaccinated uh, to make sure that we have achieved at least herd immunity. And what uh, herd immunity means is uh, basically it's it's an indirect uh, process where you are. Uh, protecting uh, the, the, the from the transmission of the disease uh, by making sure that the majority of the people that uh, are, are the population that you are working with have either been vaccinated or uh, have have had an illness before, uh, and this way you you're making sure that the transmission of the disease is not uh, is not very uh, high. Um, so. Uh, we believe that if you have herd immunity, especially in settings, in business settings, it, you should be okay. And, and you have to also take into account that in healthcare, um, we we depend a lot on uh, our staff that are fully vaccinated. Uh, and again, I mean, just because we mandated the vaccine a while back, it doesn't mean that we have 100% of our staff that are vaccinated. There are people that have medical conditions that uh, don't allow them to get vaccinated. There are people that uh, have religious beliefs that uh, that uh, cause them to get exempt from uh, from vaccination. So we believe that if you have a good number of the uh, of the population who are vaccinated, then you should be in good shape. But it also depends on what type of uh, of precautionary measures that you are allowing in your facility uh, to be able to prevent any further spread of the disease beyond vaccination. Um, you have to accommodate for people that are uh, that are not vaccinated. Uh, but to to answer your your other question regarding the, uh, the vaccination, international vaccination versus uh, local vaccination, um, it, any vaccine that has shown uh, efficacy, it should be good uh, to uh, to immunize uh, somebody with. The you know there are different vaccines that are uh, that are approved ac across the globe. Uh, so, for instance, in, in the UK, we know that Pfizer and, and uh, AstraZeneca are, are approved. I believe Moderna is approved as well. We don't have here in the United States, we don't have AstraZeneca approved yet. I think they are seeking approval by the, uh, uh, by the FDA. But the, the vaccines that we have in the United States are highly effective. Uh, they're under what we call emergency use authorization. And that's the, the, the first step in, in uh, getting a full uh, approval by the, by the FDA. Um, the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, and the J&J &J vaccine, the Jensen vaccine, are highly, uh, highly effective. We are recommending it to the public. Uh, this is the, the last step that we need to be able to get rid of the pandemic, basically. Um, as far as people that are coming from outside the United States that have been vaccinated outside of the United States and coming in, I would recommend before they seek any further vaccination for COVID-19 that they uh, talk to their uh, uh, medical doctor and uh, seek their, uh, their advice on whether they should uh, take the, uh, the vaccines that are approved in the, in the United States. There may be some uh, contraindications uh, that you have to look at. And plus, they, they might recommend that you do a, an immunology testing to see if you have developed uh, enough antibodies from the vaccine that you've had internationally to say that you are protected. You don't have to worry about taking uh, any additional vaccine for COVID-19. Does that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Good. So, Mr. Zabini. As a command center member, and we know that you are responsible for all PPE guidance and the training as well. So uh, at this time, beside vaccination, what are the guidelines for employers to create a safe work environment? Sure. Um, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, the, the CDC has put out guidance uh, 
since last year of how to reopen America. Um, and there are a lot of other organizations like the, the American Society of uh, Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning um, uh, uh, that, that put out, the engineers that have put out guidance on, on May 7th, uh, 2020, of how um, different businesses should look at uh, improving indoor air quality and uh, hygiene in their and environmental hygiene uh, in, in different uh, work settings. Um, we do have a department at Houston Methodist, uh, we call it uh, business solutions, that we work with multiple uh, organizations that are partners of ours uh, to help them assess the, the safety uh, of their uh, office spaces uh, for uh, for reoccupying the or for bringing back uh, people for work, uh, there are three areas that we look at uh, when we do that. When we do that assessment, uh, one of them being the, uh, the administrative protocols that they put in place. Uh, are they able to enforce those administrative protocols? And what I'm talking about is more of, you know, making sure that people that are sick stay home, uh, providing some ability for people that are highly vulnerable, like immunocompromised. Uh, workers to stay at home and work from home, and and other administrative uh, uh, protocols that are necessary to bring uh, people back uh, uh, safely to work. Uh, we we uh, another area that we look at is the safety protocols that they have. Uh, what PPE are they making available for their their employees to have on? Uh, have they changed any physical? Um, uh, physical space to be able to accommodate for uh, uh, different uh, social distancing practices and other uh, infection control practices? Are they uh, bringing in uh, cleaning crews that clean on a regular basis to make sure that any high touch surfaces are disinfected regularly and, and so on? So we look at those as well. But one, one of the areas, one of the biggest areas that we look at are engineering controls and the engineering protocols that you have in place. Uh, as many of you know, we, we, we know that uh, uh, COVID or SARS-CoV-2, which is a virus that causes COVID, um, can get transmitted by aerosols, uh, especially if, if, um, if you give the ability for, uh, for that virus to, um, uh, or that, that person is generating uh, aerosols. So what we look for is how did the uh, organization or how did the, the business look at the HVAC system, the air conditioning systems, and uh, are they improving the, the uh, uh, ventilation rates? Are they uh, improving the filtration rates? What type of air handlers that they have in the, uh, at the workplace? So for instance, we look at if they have uh, local uh, air handlers, which means that they are either fan coil units that sit in the ceiling and they're just recirculating air rather than scrubbing it and bringing some fresh air in versus you have big air handlers that are serving different areas. And um, like I said, the ASHRAE uh, put out a great guideline uh, for improving indoor air quality during a pandemic, meaning that uh, we look at increasing the efficiency of uh, uh, the filters and the in the air handling units, and also increasing the fresh air uh, exchange uh, rate uh, from bringing fresh air from the outside. Uh, as you know, uh, we do a lot of recirculating air in uh, to to save on efficiency. Um, so for the most part, uh, most businesses operate on 80% recirculated air, 20% fresh air. Uh, but the recommendation is to increase that. Uh, to maybe 50-50 or 70-30 uh, or something like that, to be able to uh, dilute any potential um, uh, virus that are, uh, or accumulation of virus in the environment. That's definitely answered all, all the questions here. So, uh, Annie, EY just recently conducted the largest survey on return to office and the future of workplace so what are some of the key insights from this study? Can you give us some briefings? Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, it's very nice to be with you here today. Uh, so the survey that EY conducted is the largest of its kind. Uh, we received responses from over 16,000 people across 16 countries. 
uh, and the survey also covers 23 sectors. Uh, the questions were grouped in uh, 24 uh, different subcategories based on personal factors, work factors. So the goal is once we get the results back, we could slice and dice the survey results based on age groups, uh, uh, industry, uh, the, their tenure with their employer. So there, there are many different ways to interpret the survey results. Um, so I have some slides to just share some of the highlights from the survey. Um, can we put the slides up? Sure. Um, we can go to the next one. Um, we call the survey the work reimagined because uh, this is many of us recognize this is really an opportunity for all of us to think about what workplace should look like and how work should be done going forward. Uh, we have worked in a similar manner under the old normal since the 1950s. So now it's an opportunity to think about uh, how work should be done perhaps for the next 50 years. Uh, so this survey, as you can see, this is some uh, demographic data here. Uh, there were over 16,000 people uh, in, in many Many countries, 16 countries responded uh, from a sector perspective. The technology sector had the most response, um, banking as well. Uh, and uh, they're also, uh, I mean, right now it's a very unique time in that there are five generations of uh, people working together. So a lot of the data, if you look at the responses, they're quite consistent across the different generations. Um, can we move to the next one? Uh, so there's a, this is a high level summary of, of what the overall survey, um, it, it tells us that this is really a time for change. Uh, so first of all, most of our respondents uh, believe that themselves as well as their employers reacted well to the pandemic. Uh, many continued to be productive as uh, Gu mentioned, um, and they believe that uh, they, they would be able to continue to work with flexibility going forward. So with that, uh, we see that nine out of 10 employees, they want flexibility going forward. But what does that flexibility look like? Uh, so when you look at the uh, dive deeper into the details, it's very interesting to see that uh, people want flexibility in terms of when they work and where they work. But if given a choice, people um, weight the when to work, the start and end time of their workday uh, more heavily than the location of their workplace. Uh, one third of the employees wanted shorter uh, work week. Uh, there are also uh, uh, more than half of the employees stated that if they do not have the flexibility they're looking for, then they may resign from their current job. Um, and then uh, many things are changing, but some things are not. Uh, one of them is uh, more than two thirds of the employees, they want to continue to, have to resume uh, business travel and may not look the way uh, as before pandemic, uh, but there, there are not actually more people who's willing to travel for business than pre-pandemic. Um, Next one, please. Yeah, so this is just a uh, more detail to show you when people responded balancing between when and work, uh, the time, uh, the when is, is more valuable uh, than location. Next one. Um, as uh, Faraz mentioned earlier, um, I think, you know, a lot of the companies, the challenge right now is uh, one is how do they safely bring employees uh, physically back to the office. And then the second question is, how do the current policies or protocols align with a longer term uh, or the future of work uh, protocols, policies that should be put in place? So with that, uh, with the survey data, we you know divided them into different groups uh, and we have seen our clients or we're helping them with developing personas for their employee groups. Groups. So uh, they can be largely divided into three groups. You have the office optimal. So these are um, comprised of a couple of groups. You have the 
probably the, 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 the frontline workers, the engineers, the doctors who have to be on site. And then you also have individuals, it's about 20% of the total uh, survey correspondence that they would like to go back to the old normal. So five days a week working in the office. And then you have um, on the uh, right hand side. So we, you know, the undecided group also represent a pretty large uh, percentage of the respondents, but we're, we're leaving that group out uh, for, for this analysis. But for the people who are ready to move to remote work, this tend to be, uh, as, as you can imagine, younger employees and they're overwhelmingly working in tech or service oriented uh, industries. Um, and these employees overwhelmingly believe that their company can effectively measure their productivity no matter where and when they work. And then in between is the hybrid. Um, hybrid seems to be the default answer that many companies have arrived at. Uh, it's some kind of a mix between uh, remote work as well as just spending time in the office. Uh, and the magic number seems to be between two to three days um, working remotely. Um, so so you, you see companies um, at the beginning um, of this year, uh, some of the big name tech companies came out and announced that they're going to allow their employees to work from anywhere for perpetuity. Uh, and then you also see certain other, you know, perhaps is the healthcare and banking. They want their employees to return to the office uh, as early and as safely uh, to do so as possible. But what we have seen the last few months is uh, those two kind of extreme of sectors that are now more moving towards the middle to come up with some kind of a hybrid working model going forward. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is just another dice of the information uh, looking at by age groups, uh, by work locations. This is a global survey. Um, as well as uh, the different sectors, what are the preferences? So the, the index that you see on the right-hand side, the 2.8, uh, that column uh, is between uh, whether it's the hybrid work versus the total remote. So people, uh, most of the respondent, of course, uh, the, the respondents uh, fall uh, in between a hybrid and a remote work. So that's just another confirmation that everyone is expecting flexibility going forward. Um, I think I have one more, uh, maybe two more slides. This one shows a, a, a digest by, a, by location. Uh, so LA is where people are most ready to uh, move to a future hybrid working model. I think what's surprising on this one is uh, Seattle. That is people are actually least ready to move to a hybrid working model. Um, and then the final slide, it just showed, uh, I think for us to what you have uh, spoke about earlier in terms of a lot of employees are expecting their employer to require vaccination, but then, you know, it really depends on the, 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 uh, the, the, the state and local level regulations. So even at EY, we had a debate about um, when we go back to the office after July 4th, should we require employees to all wear face mask um, in the office if they're fully vaccinated? So that, that, that's, you know, that's a debate for us. Um, so these are the, the highlights uh, from the survey. Uh, it may not fit uh, for all companies or industries, but it is a very useful data point um, as companies are looking at their policies and uh, try to operationalize the return to work. Thank you very much, Annie. This is a uh, uh, fascinating result. Uh, I have so many questions I want to follow up with, but maybe we'll save some of that for for the audience, for the Q and A, but uh, you know, I'm not surprised. LA is most ready to go remote. If you have ever commuted in LA, you know it's it's probably the worst commute in America. So, uh, remote work would definitely benefit that city. So, no matter how we return back to normalcy, either through going back to office or some kind of a, a remote hybrid model. Uh, it, it seems like post pandemic, the workspace is going to be very different from how we remember it. So for companies who 
are thinking about adopting some kind of a hybrid model or uh, to uh, you know allowing more flexibility. What are some of the issues to uh, to consider now? Like, what are some of the challenges that they have to think about? Yeah, it's. Um, I think there, there are many factors. The health and safety, for sure, is the number one concern. Uh, so most companies at this point, I think they have a framework in terms of what they need to do, but it's it's, it's about the, the return to office, the protocols, uh, the policies um, that will allow them to manage the employee expectations, their employer's obligations. Uh, but I would say there are probably three key um, factors to consider here. Uh, the first is about employee engagement. Um, I think if you look at the survey and just we're talking with clients as well. Uh, typically, uh, the leaders, people you know who are more have have more um, work tenure, they tend to want to bring employees back to the office. Some would even argue that businesses have the civil responsibility to bring their employees back to support. Uh, the restaurants near the office complex, the local economy. Uh, so the, the employee engagement and how you keep the corporate culture life is one key challenge. Um, the second would be uh, the technology, uh, digital tools improvement. So we have seen uh, through uh, the pandemic that some sectors, some businesses were able to very quickly convert to a remote remote working uh, setting uh, with all the technology tools supporting them uh, as well uh, as developing onboarding remote uh, virtual working training uh, technology tools. So those are all the key factors. So just going back to the survey, a uh, lot, lot of the employees responded that they expect 60% uh, of them expect the employer to have better technology tools for the workplace, but the other 40% also want employers to reimburse and support them in terms of tech tools uh, working from home. Um, and then uh, last but not least, going back to kind of my personal uh, specialization is in terms of employer obligations, payroll tax reporting. Uh, during the pandemic, you have one-off requests from employee to say, hey, I'm, I'm going to go, I need to go, go back home to another state or even another country to take care of my uh, family. Uh, but now the, the companies are getting much more requests for that type of flexible working and potentially long-term going forward as well. So if you have employees suddenly decided that they want to move to you know, Florida or Texas, one of the state that has no personal income tax, what would be your policy, right? How to manage that risk and educate employees as well. So this, this creates a lot of um, nexus tax issues for the employer as well as for the employee, their individual uh, matters as well. Thank you, Annie. This is very informative. And we will look at audience's question if there's any uh, additional information we need to add on later. So this is from EY. And let's look at Bank of China. So Mr. Wong, uh, what is Bank of China's plan for the future of work? Any policy changes? And uh, what is Bank of China doing physically to retrofit, reconfigure, and reinvest uh, the workplace to help corporations bring employees back to the office safely. I assume uh, your employees have not returned to office yet, correct? Correct. But what's, so what we have a small portion of the employee that are work required, the physical presence, and, and we have a small percentage already working on site. Uh, certainly some of the management member also will go in intermittently to work in the office. Uh, but I guess to answer your question, no, first of all, thank you uh, for your question, Ms. Liu, and uh, it's an honor uh, to be here today. Um, I think before we talk about our return to work uh, plan, uh, permit me to talk a little bit about what we've been doing since the, the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, the bank took a proactive approach to initiate our IMT, it stands for Incident Management Team. It's overseen by executive management, uh, led by our chief risk officer, and we work with various stakeholders from different departments to assume very responsibility uh, when we're dealing with the pandemic situation. Uh, some of the, I uh, just name a few of the department, the American Data Center, uh, 
the Operating Risk Management Department and the Price Risk Management Department, Executive Office and HR. We all work together seamlessly in handling the situation for the last for the last year and a half. Um, as far as HR is concerned, we uh, took the lead to work with multiple departments uh, to ensure the safety of our employees uh, while maintaining an interrupt, uninterrupted operations of the entire bank. And some of the actions that we have been doing and we're still currently doing are uh, to conduct contracted employee tracing, including conducting interviews. We generate weekly reports and confirm cases and quarantine status of the employee. And of course, we report to the uh, Department of Health. Uh, we also maintain social distancing, provide personal protective equipment such as masks, alcohol-based hand sanitizer and signage throughout the building. Uh, we perform deep cleaning and disinfection of the entire floor upon receiving reported cases. Uh, we also enforce elevator occupancy, maximum of four, restrict our cafeteria for only for meal pickup. We also launch the smart screen application uh, to generate daily entry pass for staff who are working on site, uh, setting up voluntary temperature screening station at the lobby. We also provide transportation reimbursement for those who work on site. And of course, the most important thing that we have been doing is to maintain periodical communication with the employees through our management's newsletter. So when we look at the um, our return to work plan, this is what we have in mind for now. Uh, the tentative returning to work schedule will be on July 6th. Uh, from the regulatory and compliance aspect, we work closely with Littler, uh, who will be our next speakers. Phil, we we'll work closely with them to ensure all actions will be in full compliance with the law. Some of the areas such as vaccination requirement, mask wearing, and etc. And as far as employees that are required to expect to return to work for department management, the deputy department head and department head and above are expected to return to work at least two days a week. Employees are expected to return at least one day a week on the rotation schedule. And given the safety concerns for those who work in the, what we call the late night shift, as well as the early morning shift, they will continue to work from home. Uh, for department management, uh, they have to ensure no more than 50% capacity, as well as 60 social distancing when they're making on-site seating arrangement. And we also encourage employee to adopt flexible work schedules, such as nine to five, 9.30 to 5.30, 10 to six, and so on. That's to avoid traffic and entrance congestions. Uh, employees also require to wear a mask at the premises. Uh, as I mentioned uh, before, communication is very important to the employee. So we'll continue to maintain our effective and timely communication with our staff. Tongue from the top is important and it's critical. So our newsletter from our CEO, uh, led by our corporate communication, communication group, our friend, a good friend, Peter uh, Reisman, uh, they've been working on that and we have a very effective communication with the employee. And Nick Chaw and all the stakeholder will continue to timely communicate with the employee regarding the pandemic. Some of the actions that we command is that we have updated, we have been updating employee regarding the vaccination information through our staff news and executive office continue to send out periodical updates on building security, hygiene, cleaning and disinfection information. We will continue to conduct contracted employees tracing and reporting. Uh, we'll continue to provide the uh, person protective equipment, such as disposable mask. And we also will be distributing some of the reusable masks with our Bank of China logo on it and other sanitary facilities throughout the building. Uh, social distancing will continue to be enforced. Uh, the bank will also be purchasing headsets for the employee for sanitary purpose. And the transit reimbursement will be continued and our building will also limit the guest visit on site unless vaccination status can be guaranteed. Uh, we also ensure that we have proper documentation for all the actions the bank has been taking since the beginning of the pandemic in case of regulatory review. And of course, you know, there's a lot of moving particles in here. And what we will do is to continue to closely monitor the development of the legal updates uh, in the next few weeks, and we will act accordingly. That's in short, it's our return to work plan. Great. Thank you, Mr. Wan. Um, I'm, I'm really fascinated by all the different perspectives that's on this panel. You know, we heard from scientists and we heard from 
you know, scientific surveys on what employers and employees, uh, you know, think about the future of work. And then we have uh, actual HR director to kind of walk out through all the complex measures that uh, a, a real company have to implement to get their employees safely back to work. Uh, so you can see uh, if, if uh, either you're a business leader or you're just uh, your employee thinking about what's going to happen for the you know, next few months and how the work is going to change, it's really complicated. There's a lot of professionals working behind the scene to make sure you know, our, our business can continue. And out of all of those different perspectives, I think maybe the legal side is the most complicated. And that's why we have, uh, have Phil here. Phil, so, uh, you know, I'm going to ask you a really straightforward question. Can employers require employees to get vaccinated? What are some of the legal nuances uh, with that question? Yeah, well, thank you very much. Thank you to the chamber and thank you, uh, Houston and DC and New York and everybody else. It's nice to see everybody. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that I agree that the legal issues are the most complicated. In, in a way, the, um, the agencies, the government has made it pretty easy for employers to impose a vaccine. There are complications and there are aspects of it that I'm going to talk about. But I tend to think that the more complicated issues are societal issues. I think people who just object to the vaccine uh, because for various reasons, whether, uh, whether they're protected by law or not, you know, because they don't think the vaccine works. Uh, I had a client who called the other day who said that someone claimed that in her community, quote unquote, they don't believe in the vaccine. They didn't, and the client did not ask what community she was referring to. Um, but, you know, is it a religion? Is it a race? Is it, um, you know, who knows what? Is it a political system? And so there's going to be a lot of pushback from employees. And I don't think that, I, I hope that this goes smoothly. And I hope that, um, that we move forward in a way where there isn't too much division. But unfortunately, given the times we're living in, there is a lot, uh, there's a lot of controversy around these. So, but to answer your question in terms of whether we can impose a vaccine, whether an employer can impose a vaccine, last week, the Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission called the EEOC, which is the agency that administers and prosecutes the uh, federal anti-discrimination laws, uh, re-amended uh, uh, the guidelines that they had uh, circulated earlier in the pandemic to make very clear that in fact employers can lawfully require employees who need to be, uh, who need to physically enter the workplace to be vaccinated for COVID-19. Now, having said that, and, and by the way, um, you know, most states, uh, I'm not aware of any state that has any contrary uh, rule. There are states like Texas, as our friend uh, Firas um, can probably talk to, uh, where the governor and other legislators and legislators have been passing laws that may make it more difficult for businesses to do things like, um, you know, review uh, vaccine status for non-employees uh, at this point for vendors. Um, and also uh, have put uh, roadblocks in front of things like vaccination passports, they call them. Um, but uh, so we're going to see a lot of, more of that, I think, local opposition. But generally speaking, right now, I'm not aware of any state that prohibits an employer from saying, if you're going to be on our work, uh, if you're going to be in our workplace, then and you're going to be, you know, working in an office with other people in close quarters that we cannot uh, impose a, a vaccine. Um, you know, so, and, and just to mention one other thing, I mean, I, I think that while they can impose a vaccine, the, uh, the other concern, not every, not every company is running to do it. I mean, what we're seeing is a lot of companies holding back and thinking about this and wondering what their peers are doing. And, you know, what, what, uh, what, you know, what does it look like out in the general market? And am I going to lose my, my best employees by imposing something like this? Uh, you know, and what's going to be the response? So it's, it's not only a legal analysis, but it's an, an, an analysis of how is this going to affect my, um, my people, um, my employees who are, you know, obviously the most valuable, uh, perhaps the most valuable asset we have. Other issues are even if we do impose a vaccine, a vaccine do we then say, okay, well, you don't have a, 
if you if you've had a vaccine that you don't have to wear a mask that we're going to drop some of these social distancing so there are different layers of questions even if you do impose a vaccine how far do you want to go how quickly do you want to move um, and again, most employers in, in our experience have not yet made a definitive decision. I do have the sense though, that given the EEOC's directive that they are moving toward it. Now, let me just get into some of the, the legal weeds because they are important. And there are a couple of exceptions to uh, the imposition of a vaccine. And, the, and there really are two exceptions that, that, I'm, that I can think of. The first is if an employee says, I've got a disability, that prevents me from getting a vaccine, that I'm, you know, I, I've got a particular sensitivity uh, or I have a disability that, you know, makes it clear the vaccine isn't gonna do anything, um, then, I, I, then they may be able to um, get, uh, to argue that you can't impose it because it's based on a, a disability and requiring them to uh, get the vaccine violates their rights under the laws that prohibit discrimination on the basis of disability. This triggers a whole bunch of obligations on the part of the employer. First, the employer has to consider whether having them in the workplace would constitute what's called a direct threat. And I think that generally speaking, if you're in an office environment, um, at, you know, the, the EEOC's guidelines make it pretty clear that you can assume safely, uh, and also the CDC guidelines, that their presence could present a direct threat. So then the question is, do you have to make a reasonable accommodation for the employee? So when someone says I've got a, 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 an objection on the basis of disability, the employer has an obligation to engage in what's called an interactive process with the employee to try to determine whether there is an accommodation that you can reach. The obvious, the most logical accommodation, the one that will come up most frequently is the opportunity to work remotely. And since we've all been working remotely, or many of us during the past year, year and a half, it appears that that can be done fairly easily. But, and the last thing we're gonna say about this though, is that the employer can actually push back a little bit. And if an employee says, I've got a disability, the employer does have the right to say to the employee, look, I want some uh, proof that you've got a disability. I need to get information from your doctor or from your medical provider that does indicate that you've got a disability before I go down this reasonable accommodation route before I go down this route of engaging in the interactive process with you to determine whether we can reach an accommodation. And by the way, there are numerous state laws dealing with interactive, uh, the interactive process. For example, in New York, the employer has to have all this in writing. And if they deny the reasonable accommodation, the employer has to provide the employee with something in writing. The second exception is religion. If the employee has a sincerely held religious belief that prevents them from getting a vaccine, then the employer may have to, uh, again, uh, engage in the interactive process and try to come to an agreement on a reasonable accommodation, which again, may be, you know, which most logically would be uh, working from home, remote work, or other kinds of accommodations, maybe being uh, separate from other employees and so forth. Um, working different shifts without getting a vaccine. Um, again, though, even with a religious exemption, if an employee objects on religious grounds, the employer does have the right to say, you know, tell me about this religion. What is, how does the religion prevent you from getting this? And while the EOC says that generally speaking, uh, the employer, um, the employer has to uh, uh, accept the employee statement. On the other hand, if the employer is aware of facts that provide an objective basis for questioning the sincere nature of this belief or the religious nature of the particular belief, then the employer would be justified in requesting additional supporting information. Again, as you can imagine, this is quite delicate and tricky, and I would recommend that you consult with counsel before going down uh, that road. Um, so there are, you know, there are a couple of other things. Obviously, if an employee says that, um, you know, I need an accommodation, well, they don't even have to say it like that. Uh, an employer, they, they can simply say, I can't really do it, or I've got some concerns about it. That may flag the issue for the employer or for the manager, and the manager may need to ask some questions to, to try to understand if they are seeking an accommodation and whether the accommodation is for reasonable 
uh, uh, grounds and lawful grounds. So it, it is important to train managers um, on these issues so that they recognize um, that when someone is requesting a reasonable accommodation and what to do when they are. Normally it's turn them over to human resources. A manager doesn't, shouldn't normally be the one engaging in this discussion. But again, if there is no reasonable accommodation, then the employer, the EOC says, the employer can bar them from the office. If you can't reach an accommodation, uh, you know, if telework doesn't, isn't going to work for you uh, in a particular situation, then you can bar them from the office. That doesn't mean necessarily that we can fire them, but they can be barred. It might trigger another obligation to do something like a leave of absence uh, as a reasonable accommodation. So yes, uh, you know, when you started by saying the legal issues can be tricky, I'm actually now maybe uh, having said all this, I'm, you know, I'm tempted to agree with you a little bit more. Um, uh, the records, of course, that we gather concerning these issues have to be kept confidential. Um, it is unlawful for an employer to disclose to other employees that someone has a, you know, a disability uh, or some other kind of condition or that they even have a reasonable accommodation. Uh, it is unlawful to retaliate against employees for uh, requesting uh, an accommodation. And by the way, one of the issues that's come up quite a bit is whether it's okay for an employer to offer an incentive to employees uh, to get a vaccination. And again, the EOC has come back and said, yes, it is lawful. You can provide an incentive. What we're seeing companies doing is maybe giving them a day off, uh, maybe paying them $100 to go get the vaccine or $50 or whatever it might be. Um, and the, uh, the final thing, uh, um, you're probably relieved to hear me say, um, that I, I wanted to mention and that I think is very important and maybe particularly for this group is that one of the things that the EOC emphasizes in their guidance, and it's, I'm very pleased that they are focusing on this, is the harassment of Asian Americans that we've seen. Um, and they are encouraging employers to do things um, to, to be alert to these kinds of comments at the workplace, um, to provide training uh, perhaps on these issues, um, to uh, certainly uh, discipline anyone who engages in inappropriate conduct, um, you know, and to take other steps to try to assist employees who, who feel you know, that they're being harassed at, uh, at the workplace. Um, certainly a reminder to the workforce noting the prohibitions on harassment, reminding employees that harassment won't be tolerated, uh, and inviting anyone who experiences or witnesses workplace harassment uh, to report it uh, to management. So that's, that's what I had to say. I don't know if you have any questions. Yeah, no. So um, like I said, complicated. <laughs> but uh, if you think that was complicated, why don't you uh, ask you the next question? So let's kind of look at the other side of the coin. Um, like you said, the, the employer has, uh, it seems like the law gives the employer the authority to request employees to get vaccinated. Uh, but you also mentioned a lot of employers are not going that far yet. They're kind of observing what their peers are doing. Um, so in, in that situation, if I am a vaccinated employee, and then I'm being asked to go back to office and then all of a sudden I realized there's a bunch of my colleagues who refuse to be vaccinated. What are my rights in that situation? Can I ask my employers to say, you have to ask them to get vaccinated or can I say I, I refuse to work with unvaccinated people? What are some of the, the, the rights and obligations in that situation? I think it's a very, very good question. I mean, I, I think that this, this does present I don't think it presents, it necessarily presents legal questions. I think somebody who is vaccinated should be protected from getting the disease, uh, even if, you know, from somebody who isn't vaccinated. Um, so I, I think that that is, um, you know, that, that there may not be uh, a scientific justification for that, although I would ask uh, our colleague Fieris, who is also here to back, back me up on that. But I, I do think that um, you know there may be circumstances where an employee has legitimate concerns. You know, for example, uh, even if you and again, Ferris, I'd like to hear from Ferris. But even if an employee who is vaccinated can't get the 
can't contract the, the, the illness, I think they may be able to carry it. And so they may be concerned about coming to work, you know, maybe uh, having the, uh, the germ, if you will, or the virus uh, and, and transmitting it to people at home. Um, I mean, I, I think that there are going to be sensitive situations like that. And uh, I'm not sure that that presents legal risk to the employer, but I do think it's going to present morale risk. And, you know, and I, I do think that at a certain point, we are going to reach a, a point where, where employers are going to feel compelled to do this. I, I got a, a call from a client the other day who said, well, how about if I let the vaccinated people work on, you know, Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays and the unvaccinated to work Tuesdays and Thursdays. And I said, you know, you can do that, but is it a great idea? I mean, you're basically segregating your workforce. You're, you know, potentially, um, you know, just causing, uh, you're, you're encouraging division. Um, and uh, the idea of, you know, we still think, I think most employers feel that there's value to having teams work together. And by separating people out, um, you know, and by it's continuing to impose things like Zoom calls on everybody, even if everybody's, if, you know, when people are vaccinated can get back into a room together and, and, and work. So I think it's, there are gonna be complications. It's a good question. I'm not sure I answered it. Very, very interesting. Ferris, can you uh, clear that up for us? Uh, sure. Even if you're vaccinated, sure. is it still a good, is it still a bad idea to hang out with, uh, with other unvaccinated people? Yeah, so uh, I can tell you this much. Uh, at, at the beginning, when uh, we started the vaccination process and all of that, uh, there was not enough information out there to tell us whether the, the vaccines will prevent even transient infections. And what we mean by transient infections, meaning that they're either asymptomatic infections that the person is able to carry the virus and spread it, or they're mildly symptomatic, but uh, they're able to uh, transmit the, uh, the virus. Uh, we now know uh, from uh, real world data that is published uh, you know, in different parts of the world, um, uh, some of them are in, in Israel because the, the vast majority of their population is vaccinated. It actually shows that the, the vaccines, especially the Pfizer, Moderna, and uh, Jensen vaccines, are highly effective in preventing infections, period, meaning that you, you cannot get infected with the, with, the, uh, with the virus. But highly, it does not mean 100%. It means um, you know, 92 to 95%. So even then, you have a percent of the population that could um, develop an, an infection, uh, whether it's transient or it's asymptomatic or mild uh, infection, and could uh, potentially spread it. In fact, we call that a breakthrough infection. And we have seen uh, where breakthrough infections are happening on a, on a constant basis. They're infrequent, but they, they do happen. Uh, so on, in other words, there is a section of the population that is still vulnerable. Uh, there is a section of population that will not develop immunity at all, even if they are vaccinated. So they, there are concerns regarding that. In, in the healthcare industry, especially in, in our organization, we are not easing the restrictions for PPE uh, just abruptly. We are gradually easing the, uh, the restrictions, meaning that we are removing one thing at a time rather than just going and say, go back to normal. You can't go back to normal right now, uh, especially knowing that the, the not, we, we don't have hard, uh, herd immunity in, in the population in, in general. Uh, now, in, in our organization, because it's a healthcare organization, we mandated the vaccine. Uh, for our uh, uh, for all of our employees. Now we did grant exemptions to some of the employees. We granted deferrals for some of the employees. Uh, so, for instance, if they have a medical condition that doesn't allow them to or is contraindicated for for the virus, then we've we've allowed the exemptions with religious exemptions, like Philip uh, mentioned. We had to grant uh, religious infection and, and, uh, and uh, exemptions, but at the same time. We are doing the investigation to make sure that those are sincere uh, and not just something that somebody is making up. Uh, I can tell you that last week before the, um, the, manda uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the mandate became effective as of Monday, uh, we had 90%, 99% of our uh, staff 
at uh, either either vaccinated, uh, and it, it's a very very high percentage. Actually, the the number of exempt employees was very low that were granted uh, uh, exemptions were very low. But now, as of uh, of Monday evening or the the Tuesday morning, a hundred percent of our staff uh, are either vaccinated or have the exemptions. So, uh, and and the reason that we did that in healthcare organization because we have a vulnerable uh, population. We have uh, patients that are vulnerable. Uh, we have visitors that could be vulnerable as well. And since our organization has made it a point that our patients are in the center of everything that we do, we felt that it is necessary for us to to mandate the vaccine. But we did not make this call very lightly. Uh, we had a uh, scientific uh, committee that looked at all the evidence behind it. I'd like to jump in if I may, and I'm sorry to Absolutely. interrupt, but there, well, we have just a couple of minutes, but I just want to say a couple of things. Okay, first of all, you know, to get back to the question that was asked, I mean, um, <clears throat> there are people out there, again, who are not going to buy all this. And I have to point out, Doctor, I mean, uh, I'm sorry I called you doctor, but uh, we, um, you know, before we came on, I, I asked you about the fact that apparently there's picketing outside the, your hospital by uh, medical per, uh, personnel who claim that the vaccine is not effective. I mean, and so you've got, you're going to have just run of the mill, ordinary folks who don't accept that the vaccine is effective. You're also even going to have people who, who are trained, you know, medical professionals who, for whatever reason, feel are, are not quite ready to accept it, maybe because it hasn't been approved yet by the FDA. Um, and so, and, and further, you're going to have situations like, I mean, I have a friend who had a liver transplant. He's still, he's not going anywhere. He's wearing a mask and he isn't taking any visitors, you know, and so I think that this is going to be an ongoing uh, issue, um, you know, whether or not there are legal uh, rights behind them. There's too much societal division. And, and that kind of ties into the audience question that uh, one of the audience questions that we received about the uh, CDC guidelines. Uh, so um, I guess, Ferris, if you could just uh, quickly kind of, uh, if, if it's ever possible to quickly answer that kind of question. Uh, I mean, how do we, how do we make people buy into the science? Well, you know, with, with the CDC guidelines, they change very frequently. And the reason for that is because as information, as scientific evidence becomes available, uh, they, they change the guidelines. Um, what we do as scientists is we look at the evidence behind the guidelines to make sure that it's sound, that we can apply it for our organization. But remember, the, the guidelines are minimum standards. Uh, in, in a healthcare organization like ours, and I, I would hope for businesses as well, that you go above the, the minimum standard. For us, we, we are not necessarily, we are above, we, we practice uh, stricter guidelines than the, the CDC guidelines. But also remember that the, the, the CDC guidelines may apply to the general population and may not apply to, to healthcare. You have to really re be careful about which guidelines you are looking at. And that's what I would, I would suggest. And look at the scientific uh, uh, information or the evidence behind it. Mm. Um, this really is a fascinating topic. Uh, with hindsight, we should have planned for two hours instead of a one. I'm sure we'll still have a lot of things to talk about. Uh, but unfortunately, we only have these experts for this hour. So, um, uh, we, we still have some submitted questions. Maybe we can get those answered offline and we can post that on, the, on our website. And then if you have other questions, I've seen more audience questions coming in, but unfortunately we are going up against the end of uh, uh, the time that we reserve with these experts and, and uh, out of respect for everybody's time, we just have to have to cut it. Maybe uh, in, in a few weeks, we can do a part two of, of this webinar thingy uh, with that. Tell us what's coming up with other CDCC webinars. Sure, we have uh, two exciting uh, events upcoming. Uh, on June 15th, Tuesday, CGCC and 
Moody's ESG Solutions invite all of you to attend our upcoming webinar, uh, Harmonization, Integration, and Innovation, Three Trends Shaping the Future of Environmental, Social, and Governance Investing. So we now uh, so far accept a lot of uh, registration already. So you're more than welcome to join us for this. And on June 24th, CGCC Annual Business Survey Report Lunch uh, and it, this event is open to public. And I highly, highly encourage and recommend all of our Chinese enterprises and uh, even local companies to join this event. And uh, 2021 is our eighth consecutive annual business survey on Chinese enterprises in the US, uh, which reflect on the US business environment and the challenges uh, encountered while uh, operating in the US. So this report uh, will be very informative and I encourage all of you to uh, join us and please stay tuned for more information regarding our upcoming events and visit cgccus.org for more details. And thank you all again for joining us today. Thank you for all, all of our panelists deliver such uh, great content today. Thank you all.